Hi, my name is Victoria Auer. Thank you for joining us today. I'd like to introduce the 2005-2006 Women's Health Today series, brought to you by the UCSF Center for Gender Equity and the UCSF Center for Excellence in Women's Health. Today, our program is Saving Our Children, the Impact of Domestic Violence, in honor of Domestic Violence Awareness Month. I'd like to introduce to you today the moderator of our panel, Dr. Miriam Martinez. She's the UCSF Associate Clinical Professor of Psychiatry and Pediatrics, is the Division Director for Infants, Children, and Adolescents for the Department of Psychiatry at San Francisco General Hospital, and the Clinical Director of LINC, the UCSF Living in a Nonviolent Community Program. Without further ado, Dr. Miriam Martinez. Thank you, Victoria. And I'd like to thank Dr. Amy Levine, Director of the Center of, uh, for Gender Equity, and Dr. Nancy Milliken, Director of the National Center of Excellence in Women's Health, for co-sponsoring this talk today. Um, with me on the panel, I'd like to thank my colleagues who've joined me to give this very important talk. Dr. Lida Bautista is a licensed clinical psychologist and co-director of training for the Child and Adolescent Service at San Francisco General Hospital. Dr. Meg McNamara, on my far left, is a general pediatrician with over 15 years experience working with at-risk children, and she founded uh, the Living in a Nonviolent Community program at the Mount Zion campus for UCSF. Dr. Chandra Goshippen, in the middle, is a licensed psychologist at the UCSF Child Trauma Research Project, which is part of the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, and I'm very grateful for you for joining me today for this important uh, discussion. What I'd like to do is first discuss what is domestic violence, what is the impact on women's health, and then I'd also like to uh, take the remainder of the time to talk about the impact of domestic violence on children. So domestic violence is defined as a pattern of assaultive and coercive behaviors including physical abuse, sexual and psychological attacks, as well as economic coercion that adolescents and adults use against their intimate partners. Physical abuse can include shoving, pushing, hitting, slapping, and alcohol or drug abuse can exacerbate the abuse. It happens really in all age groups, socioeconomic groups, ethnicities, and with same-sex couples. 20 to 30 percent of American women report being physically or sexually abused at some point in their lives by their intimate partners. And the highest rates of domestic violence actually occur in young women between the ages of 16 and 24. So when we think about domestic violence, we're often thinking that it's uh, older women, ages 20-something to 30 or in their 40s, but really it's three times more prevalent in the age groups between 16 and 24. So if you're thinking about children or adolescents just finishing high school, or young people in college, these are actually the groups, these young women are actually the groups that are most at risk for violence in their intimate partner relationships. Over 25% of adolescents actually report violence in their dating relationships, and that is quite a high number. Uh, turning now to think a little bit about the impacts on women's health, in the year 2000, 1,247 women, that's more than three a day, were murdered by their intimate partners. In addition to severe injuries uh, that can be sustained due to domestic violence, domestic violence has been linked to such health concerns as migraines, arthritis, neck and back pain, problem seeing, sexually transmitted infections, ulcers, depression, alcohol, and drug use. When you take all those conditions and the costs incurred to treat those conditions and to treat the effects emotionally because of domestic violence, we're really talking about billions of dollars that are spent every year due to domestic violence. And we really need to be thinking about this issue as a public health issue. I'd like to turn now to think a little bit about children and uh, how children are impacted by being in homes where domestic violence is occurring. Child abuse occurs in about 
33 to 77 percent of families where there is domestic violence. And in San Francisco, the estimates are that between six and 10,000 children annually are exposed in their homes to domestic violence. We know that children are affected by witnessing domestic violence and that they are at risk themselves for being hurt in those homes, that they are at risk for being abused uh, themselves. And I'd like to turn now to my panel members and begin asking a few questions with their expertise in the various areas that they work in. Dr. McNamara, um, I'd like to start with you and ask you, what are the signs and symptoms you see in the age range of children that you worked with within a pediatric setting? Well, thank you, Dr. Martinez, for the opportunity to speak about this today, because while there is growing awareness in the community and in our society at large about domestic violence, children are still oftentimes the silent victims of this problem. And we see a very wide range of problems, uh, of signs and symptoms that are associated with domestic violence um, as witnessed by children. We know from a variety of studies that have been done over the past three decades that approximately half of children who grow up in homes where they're exposed to domestic violence will actually be the direct victims of violence themselves. This may take the form of being physically abused by an mm -hmm. adult in the household, or it may be that they are in the way when there's fighting going on between the adults who live there, or between the, the victim and the perpetrator. Uh, for instance, I had a, a family who uh, came to see me, and the, there were two little girls in the family, and I was doing a routine physical exam on them for a, a well-child visit. And during the screening section of the, uh, of the examination, I was asking about whether there was anybody who um, threatened or hurt anybody in the family. And it so happened that the six-year-old girl had been injured when the father was in a rage and threw a television set aiming for the mother, but unfortunately the six-year-old was in the way. Hmm. There are also a number of other chronic complaints that come up with children um, in the form of either headaches, backache, abdominal pain is a very common one in children. Uh, we also see problems um, like bed bedwetting in a previously d dry child who will begin to start wetting the bed at night or even sometimes during the day because of some disturbance. Uh, they, they can experience sleep problems, mm -hmm. either um, extreme restlessness because of anxiety or in the form of nightmares. And um, there are other less common problems <coughs> such as vomiting. I recall one child who was in my practice who was 10 months old when he came to see me after transferring care from uh, a, pre, uh, a different location in the state. And um, the child had ha undergone a very extensive medical workup for a problem with chronic vomiting and had had numerous invasive tests done and even a, a, an inpatient hospitalization. Uh, and there was no physical or organic reason for the vomiting. And it happened over the course of my work um, with the child over the next couple of months that we realized that domestic violence was behind this problem. Mm -hmm. And I know we'll talk a little bit later about how you think about screening for domestic violence when you're seeing these symptoms in your office, but thank you for your response. And Dr. Goshippen, you work with very young children, and are you really seeing signs and symptoms that domestic violence might be happening in the home um, with very young toddlers, children, babies? Unfortunately, we do. We work with children in the zero to six age range, and we see a whole range of symptoms in that age range. And I think to understand them, we really have to think about how domestic violence impacts their sense of security and also their ability to regulate emotions, because that's a key task of early childhood. And if your father, for example, is hitting your mother, you're going to worry a lot about your safety. How can this person that you love so much be hitting somebody else? Might you be hit, as Dr. McNamara was suggesting? How can your mother protect you in this and other situations? And because of this, we're going to see a whole range of symptoms, sleeping problems and eating problems, like Dr. McNamara mentioned. But we also see a lot of social problems, such as separation anxiety, children who don't want to go to preschool or to leave their mother, who literally freak out when that has to happen. 
Um, we see regressions. So we've heard about bedwetting, how children who have previously been dry might start wetting the bed. But we'll also see delays in language. For some kids where there's chronic domestic violence, we'll see that the children just really aren't forming language. And for other children, we'll see that um, they used to have language. And after an incident, they actually are not speaking as clearly. They're not as understandable. They're going back to baby talk. We'll see new fears, children who don't um, want to go in the dark, who worry about going to the bathroom, things that are sort of hard for parents to deal with. We'll also see children who withdraw, who show very few mm -hmm. symptoms. And we're very worried about those kids, um, because they're the opposite spectrum, the children who don't seem to be showing much signs, but actually aren't engaging in activities, aren't playing like you'd hope. Some kids do the opposite. They play in a violent, aggressive way, playing out the trauma that they see, that repetitive play. And I think one of the major complaints we get is aggression, that children are brought to see us because they've been hitting, biting, kicking, sometimes other kids in school, sometimes their parents. And we have to recognize how frightening this is, especially for a mother who's been beaten, because she's worried potentially that her child is headed down the path where they're going to be aggressive, similar to the batterer, and that that can affect the relationship, which can in turn have more mm -hmm. negative consequences on the child's development. And Dr. Goshiff, and it makes sense to me that if a parent is depressed from being in a very violent relationship, um, that they won't be able to attend uh, to their baby and their toddler and take care of those basic needs that that child may have so that they can progress and develop as other children might. Uh, so it seems it's really important to um, intervene early. Um, when we're seeing domestic violence. And um, what about later in adolescence, Dr. Bautista? What are the signs and symptoms that you might see in teenagers that you work with um, when there has been a long history of domestic violence that they've been you know, witnessing in the home? Well, as you can imagine, if there's a long history of domestic violence, um, all the, the symptoms and signs that Dr. Goshippen was describing become compounded as a, a child approaches adolescence. Um, so some of the, the anger uh, that you were talking about, the outbursts, um, the aggression, we see some of that as well. Uh, sometimes the teenagers are the ones that are intervening in between their parents when there is domestic violence. So, um, so we see them also becoming hurt uh, physically. Um, the other thing that we see is also um, adolescents at times acting out aggressively toward peers. Um, so they might act ag out aggressively toward uh, other family members. They might be trying to intervene, or they also might be uh, acting out at school. Um, we also see the other range, the withdrawn, depressed. Um, they might be expressing some su suicidal ideation. Um, they might actually be cutting. And uh, teenagers also tend to isolate themselves sometimes mm -hmm. um, when there is domestic violence happening. They might um, never have learned the skills on how to relate to peers. If at an early age they were isolating themselves or they were acting out aggressively, um, if they were withdrawn, then by the time they reach adolescence, they don't have close friends that they can communicate with or they don't have the skills in which to reach out to other people. So they might isolate themselves um, in the home. They're the ones that might be um, locking themselves up in the bedroom, mm -hmm. just avoiding um, others and at school they might be the ones that eat lunch by themselves etc. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that we see is also um, sleeping and eating difficulties um, in relation to depression. Um, they might have fluctuations in their appetite, you know, don't feel like eating or emotionally overeat, um, might not be able to fall asleep, stay up watching TV all night, um, or at times have a lot of nightmares. Um, and we also see uh, symptoms of PTSD in adolescents and in children that are in smaller ages. Um, Post-traumatic stress disorder is a disorder that people often think about uh, in the general public as associated with veterans of war. But we actually see it a lot in relation to um, just witnessing violence, whether it's community violence or domestic violence. Uh, so some of the things that we might see are similar to what Dr. Goshippen was describing. Um, intrusive memories of, of the violent acts, um, repetitive play, uh, the children might just um, act out scenes of what they have witnessed, and um, they might have a lot of nightmares, as I said earlier. Uh, one of the things that we see a lot is hypervigilance, so sensitivity to loud sounds or like always scanning who's around, where's mom, is everything okay, being very, very sensitive to other people's emotional reactions at times 
or also um, avoidance of anything that reminds them of the violence. So, you know, if the violence happened in the in the living room while the child was maybe using the bathroom, maybe they don't want to go to the bathroom by themselves anymore, or something along those lines, because they're worried that it might happen again. Um, if there was a fight in the car, maybe the child doesn't want to get in the car anymore. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the symptoms and signs that we see in adolescents and throughout the range. Thank you. And Dr. McNamara, the, the problems and um, that, that you mentioned, the uh, possible uh, you know, bedwetting and um, those, those things that you're seeing in your office, um, do those things really impact kids or how do they impact kids in terms of their social, emotional and uh, development in terms of really, you know, going to school and being able to learn and focus at school? Uh, are you seeing that as well in your practice? Yes, unfortunately, we do see that because there, there's a very wide range of effects, as we've already discussed, and a lot of it has to do with the degree of violence that the child has witnessed. We, in the LINK program, have worked with children who have been witness to verbal fights between the parents, physical violence, all the way culminating in some unfortunate circumstances to children actually seeing their mothers murdered in front of them. So you can imagine that those children will have very varied responses to the trauma that they've experienced. But we, we see a number of children who refuse to go to school. Uh, they're just, um, for any variety of reasons, perhaps they're depressed or perhaps they're afraid that uh, the, the mother or the, um, will be battered worse if, if they're not there at home to somehow intervene. You mean they stay home to, how, do, how, how could they staying home prevent their mother from being battered? How does that work? Well, in some instances, the, if the batter happens to know the, the mother's schedule and, and knows the time when she's likely to be there and the children are not there, that may be a time when the, then that things routinely get worse for her. Mm -hmm. And so the child may have picked up on this and decided that he or she is going to stay home from school to prevent this problem. Also, um, children are so distracted when they do go to school because they're thinking about all the things that have happened that they've overheard or witnessed, that they're very anxious and distracted from their schoolwork. They're really unable to attend to and focus on what they should be learning. Um, and so if they have pictures, kids <coughs> remember things a lot by pictures, so if they have pictures in their heads of mommy got punched or there was blood or there was a lot of yelling and screaming, that's what maybe they're that's right. Thinking That's about at school is supposed to paying attention to what the teacher is saying, and then they can't really, you know, it's, a, it's as if the teacher has to call out their name again, like, you know, Miriam, you know, hello, are you listening? They, you, I think you get complaints that they tend to sort of uh, daydream a lot. And, and maybe, uh, Dr. Goship, and you'll talk a little bit more about that as well. But um, I'm sorry, Dr. McNamara. Well, I just, I, wanted, I also wanted to mention that sometimes um, these, these kids present with behavioral problems. Um, for instance, uh, Dr. Goship mentioned before that sometimes they are overly aggressive. And um, I had one little boy in my practice who was in preschool. And the mother reported uh, about an incident. She was very concerned that he wasn't doing so well in preschool. And when I asked what was going on, she said that the teachers had told her that he was choking another child in preschool. And this was understandably upsetting to everybody. And I asked the mother if there was any place that he may have seen this happening. And she said that, yes, in, in fact, he had witnessed her husband doing that to her. Mm -hmm. And so he was, as we've discussed, acting out what he had seen before. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Uh, Goship, and can you tell me how these problems may be impacting children's social, emotional development, their ability to learn, the very young ones, kindergarten and such? Mm -hmm. Actually, in terms of their ability to learn, we have some new data out mm -hmm. that are showing that when we compare children um, who've witnessed domestic violence to other children who've been matched in terms of um, family's income and also um, socioeconomic, I mean, and also their gender and their ethnicity, that the children who've witnessed domestic violence do significantly worse on cognitive testing. About 10 points worse, which is a significant um, difference. Um, are, are you saying that when you take kids who don't witness domestic violence and you compare them to the same socioeconomic group to kids who are witnessing domestic violence, that those kids that 
are witnessing domestic violence actually score lower on these tests that you give as a psychologist, these IQ tests? Is that what that, you're saying? That's exactly what I'm saying. And, and one, I mean, we don't think that actually cognitively they're different. We do think that it's really related to a lot of the things that Dr. McNamara was referring to, such as attention, ability to tolerate frustration, ability to form a relationship with um, an examiner who's testing them. And even during testing, we see a lot of intrusive memories coming in. We'll be using very neutral stimuli. So for example, we'll have a picture of a pair of scissors, and we'll be asking them to name what that is. Um, and sometimes, quite often, actually, we'll get kids have violent responses, such as, scissors are for cutting and stabbing, and there was blood, there was blood. Mm -hmm. And you're just, OK, we're just doing the testing now. But if you can imagine this coming up in school situations, and we know from our clinical work that it actually does, it's really going to impact the degree to which the child is able to focus and learn. And a lot of these kids, when they're triggered, will run around and do other things to distract, because the memories of what's being triggered inside is so painful. Mm -hmm. And they looked very sort of hyper and disturbed and not able to follow um, directions in the classroom. So I think it's important to understand that when we see kids in school who may appear to have hyperactivity, um, you know, this label of, of kids as, as hyper um, is maybe really a child who's just unable to focus and concentrate and is really anxious and not, you know, because they've been seeing all this stuff at night and actually for a period of, of many days, weeks, sometimes years. And that we have to be very careful when we're working with children or understanding what we're seeing in, in the office, either in a pediatric setting or as therapists or as parents, that sometimes what may appear to be a kid who's hyper and uncontrollable is actually a kid who's having a lot of trouble um, understanding and being able to focus and, and feeling safe in the world, um, really. So Dr. Bautista, is there anything else you'd like to add about what you see with adolescents in terms of how these problems or, or symptoms that you mentioned before might impact them socially, emotionally, and in terms of their ability to you know, progress in, in school? Well, if you can imagine, again, if at an early age they're having difficulty concentrating, um, they're missing out on a lot of the basic skills early on. And they're not doing well in school. They're getting bad grades. Maybe they're labeled mm -hmm. um, as hyperactive or learning disordered or something along those lines, which really impacts their self-esteem or their self-image in terms of thinking of themselves as somebody who's just dumb or who just you know can't cut it in school or something along those lines um, if there isn't an intervention early on. Uh, so this continues to multiply it and, uh, until they be reach adolescence. Mm -hmm. um, I actually often see kids who, by the time they're in high school, you know, have kind of given up on school or refuse to go to school. So even, we see it early on in kids who are worried about their parents, but in, by the time they reach adolescence, sometimes they just stop going to school because they don't think that they're going to learn or do well anyway, and they just um, cut or completely drop out. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that we see is peer difficulties, again, uh, just trouble relating to other people. They themselves might enter into relationships that are um, violent. So in a dating relationship, um, if there isn't much sense of self-worth or questioning of um, what's a healthy relationship, adolescents might find themselves also in a dating violence situation um, where they just continue to maintain the relationship uh, out of not knowing a different model of what a healthy relationship could be. And so if this girl's boyfriend slaps her, that's what she's seeing maybe every night at home, and she thinks, well, he really, really loves me. See how much he feels, see how mm -hmm. much he cares. He just... He's so jealous. He's so jealous. He really, really cares and loves me. So that seems to be normal to some of the young people that you work with. Yes, uh, unfortunately. There is that association, and also if you know if there's been domestic violence in the home all along, there isn't that sense that the parents are paying attention to mm -hmm. the teenager. So you know this person at least you know loves her so much that he gets to the point where he's angry with her or she, um, and that that violence is associated with you know love and care. Um, and there's also the other element um, that we see in terms of a cycle of violence. After there's a violent episode, perpetrators often reward or you know bring gifts to apologize feel extremely guilty and so teenagers might also uh, respond to that as see he really loves me he brought me these flowers he felt really bad it's not going to happen again um, and it's sometimes more than the parents can give at home because 
they're also caught up in um, their depression or the violence that's going on there. So unfortunately, um, there aren't a lot of outlets or uh, skills in terms of mm -hmm. how to respond to the situation. So with everything that we know about how domestic violence impacts health, uh, mental health, uh, children, uh, we know that pregnant women are extremely at risk during their pregnancy if they've been in a violent relationship or recently pregnant women um, for being battered and murdered actually by their intimate partners. With everything that we know, why don't families get help? Dr. McNamara, you know, from a pediatric perspective, um, you know, sometimes uh, parents tell us that, you know, they tolerated the beating as long as it was them, but once it got to their child, that's when they stepped in and said no. But even before that, um, why do you think it is that, you know, families just don't get help sometimes, don't reach out? That's a very good question, and I think that there are um, there are a number of answers to that question. But I think that in this day and age, there is still a lot of misunderstanding about why women would stay in a battering relationship, mm -hmm. and it's a complex thing. The person who is the batterer is not all evil. And so perhaps one of the more common reasons is ambivalence on the part of the victim, because she's in a situation where this person is mistreating her, hurting her, but when things are calmed down or when things are good, he may have many other good qualities. And so there may be some real ambivalence and perhaps she doesn't want to get him in trouble or land him in jail mm -hmm. uh, because, he, because she loves him or because he's the breadwinner for the family. Um, there is also the factor of shame. People feel ashamed to be in a relationship like this or they feel ashamed to have to admit that they are in this situation. Some of the people think that they have developed such low self-esteem from chronic battering that they may feel that they deserve it. Um, but oftentimes they're just ashamed that they can't seem to find a way out of the situation. There's also fear, the, uh, the fear of reprisal if somehow the perpetrator finds out that she told somebody about the violence in their relationship that this may increase the danger for her because perhaps he will be even harder on her. Um, maybe she'll get an extra beating or, or something akin to that. Um, there are also issues with people who are um, not u yet U.S. citizens because they have fears about their immigration status. Perhaps they're here um, on some sort of extension of their husband's visa or his citizenship because he's the host. And she may fear that, there, that this will somehow have an impact on her own immigration status. And people are particularly fearful about that when it comes to thinking that they may have to leave the country and then what happens with their children who are U.S. citizens because they were born here. Well, well do um, people have to worry about that when they go into domestic violence shelters about immigration or...? It's it's that it's the fear that they, that that will happen um, mm -hmm. more than the reality. Mm -hmm. um, but I and I did have a family in my practice where that was the case. The and the, both of the parents were professionals, but she she was um, studying medicine and the dad was already a college professor, and she was fearful that this would somehow affect her immigration status mm -hmm. if, because he would just say, "Fine, you go back, and mm -hmm. my son will stay here with me." Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, there's also the concern about a report to Child Protective Services. And this is, um, this is a little bit of a sticky wicket because in some counties, in some states, there is a requirement that the um, provider make a report to Child Protective Services when he, he or she finds out that their child is witnessing domestic violence. That is not the case in most places, but it's important for providers to know the laws and the legal mandate in the place where they're practicing about this because um, I think that most places have um, turned those laws around recognizing that if you uh, take action against the mother because the child is witnessing domestic violence, you're actually punishing the victim 
Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that she's not protecting her child, mm -hmm. but it is a complicated issue, and there is that fear of a CPS report or Child Protective Service report in some instances. And some physicians do have to make our mandated reporters, but as a pediatrician, you're not a mandated reporter in terms of reporting about the domestic violence. I know, of course, you're a mandated reporter in terms of reporting child abuse, but... That's correct. That's correct. It, in, in the state of California, and again, this will be different for members of the audience who are practicing in different places or who live in different places, but in the state of California, pediatricians are not re required to report on uh, victims of domestic violence because the, the mother it, who, uh, in our circumstance will not be, is not our patient. And so uh, people, providers who are taking care of women who have physical s side effects from being beaten mm -hmm. uh, or otherwise harmed are required to report, but pediatricians are not. And again, we're talking mainly about mothers, but uh, the domestic violence happens in same-sex couples where there might be two mothers or it could happen where there are two fathers. And so just want to say we're focusing right, on we're generalizing here mothers, because but because that's the majority of the victims, yes. That's right. And uh, Dr. Goshippen, uh, can you um, say a little bit about what you um, see in terms of, you know, with very young children, why families aren't getting help? What do they say to you, even with, you know, a toddler in the home who's in, who's in danger? Well, I think when they come to us first, they really want to believe that their child has not seen the violence. Mm -hmm. That they try, we, we work with many lovely mothers who, despite the fact that they are battered, are truly lovely with their children and have tried to protect them and shield them. And have tried so hard, even emotionally, to protect them and shield them that they want to really believe that their child is not affected. And I think that, unfortunately, we see that that is not the case. That the kids hear things, they often see things they wish, their parents wish they had never seen. And that in session, when given the opportunity, when we open the door and say, mommy and daddy have been fighting, that they often will play out the whole thing in front of their mothers. And their mothers, even this is even before they have language, and their mothers will sit there and say, oh my goodness, he just showed me exactly what happened. So we have to get over that barrier. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, even when we work with young kids who really didn't see what happened, we know that they're affected. Earlier you mentioned that isn't it the case when mothers are depressed that that affects their children. And we know there's a tremendous literature on depressed mothers and how that affects young children's functioning. Mm -hmm. And that even the most loving mother who is crying and sad um, is not really able to fully, fully always be there for her child. And that children are also very vigilant and sensitive to our emotions. So no matter how hard we try to hide it, they know when we're not OK. They know that something has happened. And they may be very worried or scared, and we may see symptoms. So let me see if I'm understanding. Um, a, a parent may be trying to think, Dr. Goship, in that, you know, the kid was in the other room, didn't see it, or that there was yelling, but it wasn't that scary. Um, and it's, it's, they don't get help because they just really also don't think that it's impacting their child because their kid doesn't understand, child doesn't even have language yet. Maybe then when the child hits Head Start or kindergarten and maybe the teacher starts saying, you know, your child isn't socializing the way other kids are, or your kid seems to be really aggressive, then they might come to you. They might be referred to you for, for help. And in your assessment, you're uncovering that the child actually has been witnessing domestic violence uh, quite a bit of the time. Can I just say, you yes. said something really key that I think everybody mm -hmm. has to remember, and that's in our assessment. In the majority of clinics, we don't always assess for this. For domestic violence. For domestic that's violence. Right. Yes. And I think it's hugely mm -hmm. important that when a child comes because they're, for any reason, withdrawn, aggressed, that we at least do some kind of trauma screen. It might be domestic violence, it might be community violence, but that we ask the questions so that we can make those links. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you. And, and why wouldn't a teenager get help, uh, Dr. Bautista? I've, you know, I'm 16 years old and my boyfriend's pulling my hair and punching me um, after a date and then calling me the next day and saying it's just because, you know, I really love you, I'm sorry. Why wouldn't a teenager talk to someone, a counselor at the school and get help or to their parent? Well, what gets I, in the way? Again, I think it's uh, in, if they have been witnessing domestic violence at home, um, whether it was at an early age or throughout their life, they don't have a healthy model of what a relationship is like. They might think that healthy relationships are only on TV, but in reality, you know, the good comes with the bad, and mm -hmm. that violence is just part of what a relationship looks like. 
Uh, so adolescents might not seek help because they just don't recognize that this is a problem. Um, the other reason that teenagers might not seek help is uh, if they think that there's going to be some extreme consequences, that they're the ones that are going to get in trouble. Um, so if they're not allowed to date, for example, um, that their, their relationship will be jeopardized. Um, as I think especially in, in the case of gay teens, they're going to be protective of the relationship if, they're not, if it's something that's already stigmatized, um, if they're not out to their parents, then it becomes a bigger secret that they have to you know, that they might be protective of. It's a really important point, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and as I was saying earlier also, the cycle of violence um, where, you know, they think, well, he's, he really means it this time or she really means it this time and, you know, they apologize, they feel guilty, they brought gifts, it's going to end. Um, so they might not do anything about it for that reason. Um, I also, the immigration status also can be an issue for, for young adults and teenagers. They themselves might not be, um, might not have legal status in this country. Um, so some of it might be the fear um, that calling the police or going to a provider will trigger some kind of INS call. And um, it's important to clarify with teens that that is not the case. That teachers, psychologists, counselors, pediatricians are not required or mandated to call the INS um, or even check what the legal status is. Uh, so that might be another reason that adolescents are, are not seeking out help um, mm -hmm. for dating violence relationships. I know we mentioned aggression before and how you might see it in young children, you know, biting, kicking, hitting maybe in preschools, but do teenagers ever in, in school um, also, you know, get aggressive with other teens and is that what we're seeing sometimes? Certainly. Uh, certainly sometimes the perpetrators themselves are also witnessing domestic violence at home. Um, so they might be the perpetrators in a relationship. Um, but also just getting into fights you know, at school with other peers, um, not knowing how to manage those emotions, um, not knowing how to deal with situations, and not knowing how to resolve problems because mm -hmm. they've never had a model of how to resolve a problem by talking something out or negotiating or something along those lines. So we do see teenagers getting, acting out, you know, yelling at the teacher or cussing, but also aggressive with their peers. Um, but they also might be the ones that are perpetrating in a relationship um, because they don't know how to manage their emotions. So mm -hmm. they might very well mean not to hurt their, their um, boyfriend or girlfriend and actually may, you know, as, as Dr. McNamara was talking about, you know, might have good qualities and love their partner, etc., mm -hmm. but um, don't know how to manage those emotions and might have a quick burst mm -hmm. um, and lose control over their anger as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, one last question for Dr. Goshippen has to do, I know you work a lot with Latino families as do actually the entire panel, but um, in terms of cultural issues that might get in the way of, of uh, seeking help, um, do families sometimes feel like it's bad, but I have to keep the family together, and that's you know what I saw my parents do, and it'd be a huge shame also to get a divorce, get you know get out of this relationship. I need to stay. I, that's if they're married. Most definitely, we see that in Latino families and also in Asian families and across different cultural groups, where the value is so important on the family that better that you be better than that your child lose his father, um, because there are good aspects to his father. The other thing also is because the family unit is also extended and often quite close, losing the father, reporting the father for many mothers also involves losing part of the extended family. Mm -hmm. We've had a lot of mothers where once they've made, rep made reports on the father or called them, the hard part for them was really dealing with the reprisals from the other family members. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they've been surprised because the other family members have really been supportive and have been there and in other cases They've, the other family members have said, well, you've taken our, our business out into the public, and we've had to really work therapeutically with the whole family in order to help them move beyond that. Thank you. And uh, Dr. McNamara, I want to ask you, begin with you, um, with everything that we've, we've heard, um, what, what can we really do? Um, what can pediatricians do? What can primary care providers do to help families? Um, uh, you mentioned a little bit about uh, screening. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about that and what we should be thinking about in terms of primary care providers? Sure. I think it's very important for um, us in our role as primary care providers to be clear that we are not advising the woman to leave the batterer. We are um, trying to 
provide assistance and support. And so um, there, there are a number of ways in which we can do this, but you know, we want her to understand that she does not deserve to be treated this way and that it's not her fault and that help is available if she so chooses. And so there are a couple of, th there are a variety of settings um, where it's important to ask these questions. If a child comes in and shows some sign of physical injury, it's very important to find out whether he or she was a victim of violence. And um, so instead of, uh, this, particularly with teenagers, I sometimes ask a very direct question, like, who hit you? Um, because that way, if somebody hit them, they can tell me, whereas they don't have to make up a story about walking into a door. And that's very contrary to way, the way that we normally practice, because we are used to op asking open-ended questions. But in those particular instances, sometimes it's more helpful to go for the direct question and then open it up after that. So there are different <coughs> techniques you use as a pediatrician, of course, depending on the age of the patient that's in your office. That's With right. a teenager, you might be just more direct, ask the question. That's true. They're more, you know, open that way and might just answer your question because it's like, oh, well, she must know that teenagers sometimes get hit, so I'll answer the question. That yeah. works with adults as well. I, I, I wouldn't point. be so as likely to do that with a small child, but mm -hmm. um, the, uh, in other instances when somebody is coming back repeatedly for chronic health problems, as I mentioned before, a chronic abdominal pain, headaches, mm -hmm. um, things of that sort, uh, I'm not suggesting in any way that domestic violence is the cause of all of these problems. There are very many things that cause all of these problems and um, we, we see any variety of, of uh, causes, but it is important to ask that in the, the overall interview because we want to screen and find out whether that is the source of the stress in the young person's life. Um, so those are, those are times when we would ask if there are particular signs or symptoms. Um, other, the, another important time to do it is just at our annual checkups because pediatricians and other primary care providers are in kind of a special place because we have extended relationships with people. People are coming back repeatedly. We develop trusted relationships with our patients and families. And so we're really in a very good position to ask these kinds of sensitive questions about whether somebody is hurting or threatening the, somebody in the mm -hmm. family. And um, I've been very um, surprised that people are willing to talk to you about these things if you ask them straightforward questions. You know, pe not always. People will not always disclose this on the first time by any means, but particularly if you ask the question repeatedly on an annual visit, eventually something might tip them over. And I've had that experience a number of times where I had families who I had seen for years and maybe the third or fourth year in a row when I was going through my screening questions, somebody said, well, yes, actually. Mm -hmm. So just because you asked once, it doesn't mean that you stop asking. You ask at each and every single visit and take that opportunity. Right, because and your the screening mother may not have uh -huh. been ready to talk about it before. Yeah. And, right. um, and the, you, um, we have to be prepared um, to, for what to do in the case that there is a disclosure. Mm -hmm. I'm not suggesting that we as pediatricians or any kind of primary health care people would be in a position to fix the problem and I, I, that's not the mm -hmm. realm of our expertise and it's certainly none of our business. But again, I want to just emphasize that we can uh, let the person know that we care and that there is support available. And so there are some techniques that I use to remove the child from the room if I'm getting an inkling that they're during the screening process that there is a, a concern. Um, and so for the pediatric practice, I find it very effective to um, say, well, I'd like to talk with you more about that and then have the child go for um, a vision screen or a hearing screen, which may or may not strictly be necessary, but it's a great way to remove the child from the room so that you can have a more frank discussion with the adult. Um, sometimes getting a urine specimen works really well too. It <laughs> buys you a few extra minutes. Um, or having the child go to color a picture at the nursing station. Those are this, because um, if you're gonna get into a more detailed discussion with a parent, and the child is a verbal child, mm -hmm. it is safer for the, the child and mother to have them separate. And, and this doesn't need to be an hour-long interview. This can be a brief intervention. What's kind of, Dr. McNamara, what you've said, I think, before in, in, in your teaching and training, that it's, it's like asking the question like you would about 
uh, guns in the home, right? Or what are some of the other screening questions you ask? Uh, well, I do a general abuse, safety so screening. Safety so screening. We, you know, we mm -hmm. go over whether the smoke alarms are working, whether right. people use car seats or seat belts, bicycle safety helmets, mm -hmm. uh, guns in the home, if mm -hmm. anybody is threatening them or causing problems. So you them. put the question of domestic violence right in there. And then it normalizes it for people. And right. I really do not have people take umbrage at that mm -hmm. for the most part. I think perhaps because I've incorporated into an overall screen, uh, safety screening. People mm -hmm. understand that that's where I'm going with those questions. Mm -hmm. And I want to clarify something you said because I know that you've devoted your academic and your, your, you know, your pediatric practice to working with children that are abused. And you just a minute ago said it really isn't our business. But I, I know what you were saying that because that's a, a big. Actually, it's actually a campaign, right, for the right. Domestic was, Violence Awareness Month. But I, I understand so. what you're saying that <laughs> you you wouldn't even have the tools to know. And, and uh, why don't you explain what you meant okay. by that? As right. Opposed I, to my I, trying I, to do I certainly that. misspoke. Um, but I I meant only that um, it's not within our purview to fix the the family's um, problems or to make mm -hmm. decisions for the mother mm -hmm. about what she chooses to do, to do um, vis a vis her family, but we need to make sure the child is safe mm -hmm. and we need to make sure that there are resources available so that the child can hopefully grow up in a, in a safe and loving environment. <laughs> and so I, I just quickly want to say that it can save the providers a lot of time if, um, if you can gather the, you know, some sort of a resource list so that you have it available should this come up so that it's not you know, some sort of big flail in the office. So be prepared. Don't ask the question and then be running outside trying to find those resources. Right. And there, Doctor, uh, uh, just, okay. and there is a video available that um, mm -hmm. we can mention at the end that's called Screen to End Abuse. Screen to End Abuse. That's right. Where do we, where, if someone wants to find that video, can you say how they could find it? Right. It was produced um, by the Family Violence Prevention Fund in mm -hmm. conjunction with LINK, and it can be found on the, um, by going to the LINK website, and I think that you're going to provide that mm -hmm. link at the end. Okay. So. Dr. Goship, and how do you work um, in a, uh, as a therapist with very young children? Are there therapies that, that can help very young children? What, what do you do with a, a four-year-old, a three-year-old? There are, there are very good therapies that have been shown to be effective and efficacious um, treatments. And I think it is really important that we look at intervening with this age group because we have to intervene early. There are two excellent treatments um, that I can mention right off, but one is infant parent psychotherapy, which was developed by Selma Freiberg, and one is child parent psychotherapy, which is an extension of infant parent psychotherapy and extends it up to the age, ages of six. Is that where you're working with the infant or toddler in the room together with the therapist? It is. It's a dyadic treatment. And it was developed by Alicia Lieberman and Patricia Van Horn at the Child Trauma Research Project. But we've been working with the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, which is a, a fabulous resource. It's a network of over 50 sites across the country that focus on working with young children who've been exposed to traumas. And in my work, I've really found that there are some core elements in working with kids and that they are a focus on safety involving the caregiver and the treatment, especially with young treatment, because that attachment relationship is key to the child's functioning. So we actually have the caregiver always in the room. Working with affect regulation, so helping the child to really learn ways to soothe themselves and calm themselves down, often supporting the parent in helping the child do this, Sometimes we know that if the parent is not okay, the young child is not okay. Mm -hmm. So we may need to help the parent first. And then the last core thing that we're really finding common across all programs is really talking about the trauma, talking about how it's affected the child's development, really opening the door to saying that there's been this domestic violence that's happened in the family, exposing the pink elephant that's in the room. And when the parent and child are in the room saying, you know, you're here because daddy used to hit mommy, and really allowing the child to talk or play about it with their mother, creating what we call a trauma narrative if they're both of, um, able to do that. Okay. Thank you. And Dr. Bautista, lastly, um, how do you work with teenagers? Do they really, you know, want to come in and talk to you about these things that are going on at home? Do they come in for individual therapy? Or? They actually do. Um, I think adolescents, given the opportunity, are really craving somewhere where they can talk about this um, and somebody that they can talk to who understands what's going on with them. Um, 
the other thing that we tend to do with adolescents is also um, providing a group therapy experience for them so that they realize they're not the only one who's gone through this. They can have other peers that they can relate to, whether they're in a dating violence relationship themselves or witnessing domestic violence at home. Um, we find that group therapy is a very effective way of providing support for adolescents and providing an opportunity for them to process what their experience has been. What about schools? Can schools do anything to help intervene? Um, Certainly. Um, Counselors often uh, step in, but also in health classes. I've had clients who have talked about these issues in health class where they can provide psychoeducation about what is a healthy relationship, what are the elements um, about how to communicate effectively. Uh, some of the things that we do in therapy is also you know, just kind of increasing awareness of like their body and their emotions so that they can actually put some of these skills into practice when they learn, mm -hmm. whether it's at school or through therapy or through counseling. Do you involve their families in therapy too? Will they come in together as a group? Yes, so depending on what the situation is um, in terms how of how safe violence, it is mm -hmm. um, at home. We I have actually done uh, dyadic work with teenagers and their moms, um, where there is still a lot of resentment at times, or just a, a real desire to create a closer relationship after the violence has stopped. Um, or to address any issues that had come up uh, in terms of the, the patterns that that um, evolve over time when there is violence in the in the home. Okay. Well, I want to thank the my panel members very much for coming in and talking about this uh, very difficult topic. And I want to open it up to any questions that there might be, either from our web audience um, who may be. Uh, coming in with questions, or I'll take any questions that there might be now from the audience. Can you describe a little bit about the problems that exist after <coughs> the occurrence of, the, of domestic violence has stopped for children? So in terms of like an incident happened and then time has passed, what, what needs to happen to continue an intervention? Can you repeat the question? <coughs> Sure, no, not you. <laughs> the person that's oh. going to answer. So what needs to happen after an, uh, a violent incident has happened and to help the child, to help them sort of continue on, right? Or after the violence. After the violence has happened. I mean, I think that's a really good question and it depends a lot. It depends on whether or not, for example, the family is able to really form in some way, we call it a protective shield, to sort of step in and say this bad thing has happened, we're very sorry. And in many cases, family members are able to sort of protect their children by saying this thing has happened and how it won't happen in the future. Also, it, it depends on the degree to which the family members are able to regulate affect in that family anyway. Is this happening sort of in an environment where this is the one bad thing that happens, in which cases many times, again, you have family members who are able to sort of step in and help protect the child and sort of show them other ways of coping with anger. And it depends on the child's temperament because some children are more sensitive than other children. Some children are going to remember it. I think what really helps is when you have open lines of communication, when you're able to sort of say to the child in a way to leave the door open so that they can talk about it with their caregiver and then to reestablish the sense of safety and of affect regulation. And what we might see also, and I think Dr. Bautista spoke to this a little bit, is that even, you know, if the violence stopped when the child was seven, uh, when they get into dating relationships, when the kids are now in high school and they're young people and they're figuring out how to be in relationships, it might be that some of those symptoms of, of uh, flashbacks and kind of being anxious about being in relationships and nervous and not sure how to, you know, have safety in those relationships and stop someone who, you know, might be getting a little bit too aggressive with them. Uh, that might be a time when young people need to be referred to therapy as well. So uh, we're out of time. Okay. I want to thank you very much for coming to the Women's Health at 12 uh, <coughs> talk today. And again, thank you to the panel members for joining me.